Perseverance has been on Mars for two years. Are black holes the source of dark energy? Universe breaking galaxies found and an early warning system for asteroids. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Time flies when you're exploring Mars. Doesn't it just feel like yesterday that NASA's Perseverance rover arrived on Mars? Well, it's been two years. The rover has been going strong, exploring the surface of Mars, collecting samples, grinding into rocks and sampling the atmosphere, listening to the sounds on Mars, and of course, deploying a helicopter to help with its exploration. This week, NASA released a really cool time lapse from the perspective of the Perseverance rover's front left hazard avoidance camera. NASA also provided us a bunch of stats, including the number of times it's fired its various lasers, done ground penetrating radar scans, the number of times that it has sampled the atmosphere, listened to sounds on Mars, and it's taken 166,000 pictures so far from the surface of Mars. But one of the most exciting milestones is that Perseverance has collected a total of 18 samples of Mars that's holding internally. It's going to be delivering these to a future Mars sample return mission. And it's also deposited 10 samples out onto the surface of Mars. And these are backups. So if anything ever happens to the main samples, then these can be collected and returned to Earth as well. Eight of those samples are just chunks of rock or regolith. One of them is an atmospheric sample. And then the other one is called a witness capsule. And this is where they're trying to get a sense of how much contamination from Earth could be getting into the samples on Mars when they return these samples back to Earth. This will give them sort of a baseline. But not only is Perseverance doing well, the Ingenuity helicopter is doing well, in fact, surprisingly well, like we're closing in on 50 flights for Ingenuity so far. And it was never expected to fly more than a half dozen times. So this is all bonus territory. It got kind of scary back in May last year when Ingenuity ran out of power for the first time during one of the long Martian nights. The cold on Mars is a killer to the batteries on these various rovers. This is what took out opportunity. And this is what potentially could take out Ingenuity. If it runs out of power, it can't keep its batteries warm enough. And then they freeze and then it's not able to restart itself when the sunlight returns the next day. And so when Ingenuity ran out of power, NASA was a little concerned they weren't going to hear from it again. But surprise, it did wake up the next morning. It didn't know when it was where it was because it had run out of power, not even enough power to keep its computers running. But then it was able to collect solar power was able to wake up, restore communications and able to survive through to the next night. And then it ran out of power again. And it had been doing this fairly regularly. And NASA figured, okay, this is probably the end if it doesn't get around us. But surprisingly, it was able to last all the way through the Martian winter. And then as the Martian spring approached, as the days got longer, as the nights got shorter, it was able to start building up more and more power in its batteries to the point that it's able to fly on a regular basis. It's no longer running a power at night and it's able to continue going. So this is great news for it to be able to last through the Martian winter night and make it through to longer days means that we're going to be able to see a lot more flights coming from this helicopter. Big galaxies too early. All right, you're going to need to put your skeptic hat on firmly for this next couple of stories. And that's because they are groundbreaking, if true, if true. <laughs> so researchers were using JWST and they were able to look at galaxies that were between 500 and 700 million years after the Big Bang, about 3% of the age of the universe compared to its current age. And they were looking for the kinds of galaxies that you might see during that time. And they found six examples of galaxies that were surprisingly large. In some cases, these galaxies were as big or bigger than the Milky Way. And this shouldn't be possible. At this point in the universe, we should be seeing these much smaller dwarf galaxies coming together, forming the larger structures that eventually lead into the large mature galaxies that we see today. The researchers who found these galaxies called them universe breakers. And that's because to have galaxies this big this early, 
you're looking to overturn about 99% of existing cosmological models for how the universe came together. Now there's lots of different ideas about how dwarf galaxies came together at various speeds, but nobody ever anticipated anything that was going to be this big this early. I mentioned Paul Sutter's famous quote, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong on a recent interview, and I'm gonna to have to use it again. And that's because to see galaxies this big this early is totally unexpected and is going to require a lot of follow on research. The researchers provide some examples of what it also might be if it's not galaxies, like they could be supermassive black holes that are partly obscured, or maybe there's some other phenomena that astronomers have never seen before. But if they are galaxies, then it means that the amount of stars present in the universe is about 100 times greater than current cosmological models are predicting. And that's a surprise. Speaking of surprises, are black holes a source of dark energy? Another really interesting paper that came out this week is that there seems to be a correlation between the mass of supermassive black holes and the amount of dark energy that has been entering the universe. Now dark energy was first discovered back in 1998. It's this mysterious acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And astronomers have no idea what it is just that distant objects are speeding away faster than they should be. And they proposed a lot of ideas the cosmological constant, there's some kind of vacuum energy that is appearing in every cubic meter of the universe. Astronomers have been measuring the mass of supermassive black holes at different times in the universe and have discovered that they're growing surprisingly quickly, even when they don't have access to fuel. In these giant galaxies, they've grown by eight to 20 times over several billion years, but these galaxies should be out of the raw material to feed into supermassive black holes. So how are they growing? This is a mystery. At the same time, the researchers who measured this increase in mass for supermassive black holes tied this as a very close correlation to the amount of dark energy that is being added to the universe over the same time. Astronomers say there's about a 99.98% correlation between the increasing mass of the black holes and the expansion rate of the universe. And that sounds impressive. Like that sounds almost certain. But that's only a 3.9 sigma, which is statistically significant, but not great when you think about the five or six sigma that you want for certainty, like the discovery of the Higgs boson. And you've probably heard the term correlation isn't causation. So it could just be a coincidence that these black holes are growing and dark energy is increasing and the numbers are roughly similar. There could be a mistake in the measurement, there could be all kinds of things going on. And I say that because again, it's very interesting if true. And so it's probably wrong. Now I've got a long in depth interview with Dr. Chris Pearson, who is one of the researchers behind this paper, and he goes into the findings, and then speculates on what could be the mechanism that's connecting dark energy with black holes, looking to the moon's permanently shadowed craters. We've talked several times here on the show that the South Pole of the moon is one of the most interesting places for future human exploration. And that's because this region contains these permanently shadowed craters, where there could be deposits of water ice left over for billions of years, and it hasn't been hit by sunlight. And so it hasn't been sublimated into space. And so if you want to set up a base on the moon, you want access to water, it's going to be in these permanently shadowed craters. Before we send the humans, it makes sense to scan these craters and really understand what's going on inside of them. And NASA has a new powerful tool at the moon able to scan inside these craters. It's called Shadow Cam, and it's one of the instruments on board South Korea's Danuri spacecraft. It's the same kind of optic system as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and this has been giving us so many amazing pictures of the surface of the moon, but it's designed to see in very low light. It's 200 times more light sensitive than the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's version of the camera. And because these are permanently shadowed craters, you're only going to get reflected incident light that's making its way into the craters, you need a really low light sensitive camera to be able to do this. And so NASA released some of the just the first test images that they've taken with shadow cam. And you can see that the images it's able to take are dramatically better than anything the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to see. But we've got some bad news. 
And this is the other mission that NASA is sending to image the South Pole of the moon called the lunar flashlight. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago that the lunar flashlight was having problems with its propulsion system and NASA was going to try to keep debugging the issue, try to see if they could figure out some kind of workaround. They haven't been able to solve the problem. And it's really looking now that the spacecraft won't be able to go into the lunar orbit that they were hoping. So plan B is to keep the lunar flashlight in orbit around the Earth and have it make a relatively close flyby to the south pole of the moon about once a month. So instead of making a flyby on a regular basis, it's going to be about once a month, but it should still be able to do scans of these south pole craters and try to help reveal what's going on inside of them. Now, if you like the work that we do and you think it's important for there to be an independent space news agency out there, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? It's definitely a tough time for online websites. Uh, our revenue from advertising has dropped about 68% in the last year, which is making things tricky. So if you want to join this amazing community of people who support the work that we do so that we are completely independent from the rise and fall of advertising, that would be amazing. Also, if you join our Patreon, I'll remove all the ads from the Universe Today website forever. You get advanced access to other videos, interviews, things that we do, and we'll put your name in the various videos that we make. So please join our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Europe is building an early warning system for asteroids. We've had a few more examples that we live in a cosmic shooting gallery. Last week, we talked about the meteor that exploded in the air above the English Channel. We got a prediction of it, which was great. This week, we learned that researchers have discovered a 500 kilogram meteorite that fell in Texas. People describe it as the size of a corgi, which is a very strange measurement system to me. Obviously, we want to get more advanced notice of these asteroids. And we learned that the European Space Agency is building a new spacecraft that they're going to be flying to the Earth Sun L1 Lagrange point. This is the one that's in between the Earth and the Sun. It's called NEOMIR, the Near Earth Object Mission in the Infrared. So it will be an infrared space telescope that will have a great view to a region around the sun that is invisible to us here on Earth. Telescopes can't look in this region because the sun is so bright. But once you're out in space, you don't really see that same glare in the atmosphere. And you can look for things that are really close to the sun. And in the infrared, the glare from the sun is not as dramatic as it is invisible light. With this instrument, ESA thinks that they'll be able to detect all the 20 meter size asteroids and give about three weeks notice before they impact the Earth. And an example of an asteroid like that was Chelyabinsk, which came out of nowhere and caused some amount of damage to the region of Russia about 10 years ago. And we know that NASA is also planning to launch its NEO surveyor mission. And so you're going to have these two instruments in space that will be working together to try and find all of the potentially dangerous near Earth asteroids. And speaking of asteroids, we got some really cool images of an asteroid that came relatively close to the Earth. The object is called 2011 AG5. And when it was first discovered, it was considered one of the most hazardous objects that astronomers had found so far. They had calculated that it was going to make a very close flyby in 2040 and maybe even impact the Earth. Follow-on observations have shown, in fact, no, it's not going to get that close to the Earth, probably about three times the Earth-Moon distance. So we're safe from this object. But it made a close flyby of the Earth in late January, and astronomers took this opportunity to scan it with a radar system on the Goldstone antenna. Now, this is the same kind of instrument that the Arecibo telescope used to do to scan asteroids. But of course, Arecibo collapsed a couple of years ago. And so now there are just a few of these radar systems out there. These scans were made when the asteroid came within about 1.8 million kilometers of Earth, which is about five times the distance between the Earth and the moon. And from these scans, it was able to see that this object is about 500 meters long and really has almost the exact same proportions as the Empire State Building in New York City. It has a length to width ratio of about 10 to 3, which is more elongated than almost any asteroid that's ever been seen before. 
I mean, it's not as elongated as the Oumuamua object is, but still very elongated. And NASA said in a recent press release, they've scanned 1,040 near Earth objects, and this is the most elongated they've ever seen. So we're safe from this asteroid, but it's a great opportunity to watch it carefully as it passes the Earth. I wanted to wrap up this episode with a really cool time lapse sequence that was taken by the European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter spacecraft. And this is one of the spacecraft that is on its way to the sun to help better understand that gigantic thermonuclear ball of fire that's right over there. And from its perspective, it was able to watch as Mercury passed directly in front of the sun. And this scene looks like it's out of a science fiction movie. You can see the disk of Mercury passing in front of these giant complex structures on the surface of the sun. This was an opportunity for the engineers working with Solar Orbiter to fine tune the instruments on board the spacecraft so that as they make more and more observations of the sun, they'll have this as a way to calibrate it. Such a cool image. All right, those were all the stories that we had today. Of course, we're gonna have links to everything we talked about in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, interstellar adventurers and the galaxy wanderers and a special thanks to david giltonan mod sue george jeremy matter jordan young tim whalen dave verabayoff josh schultz and m Drum gross who support us at the master of the universe level all your support means the universe to us all right that was all the news for today we'll see you next week